A clinical examination that you could do at home to show you what you can do to get information to give us more information and possibly to help the horse out before we get there the most important things really are your TPR which is temperature pulse and respiration rate um, we always take the respiration rate first as vets anyway because I normally tend to do it over the stable door before I go in because horses tend to get sort of white coat syndrome or in our case beige overall syndrome where all of the rates tend to shoot up when we go towards them. Um, so it's a good idea to take that first. Obviously if it's your horse it's a bit different because they're not going to be freaked out when you walk up to them. Um, but even before then, I think it, there's quite an art to just standing back and looking and just looking the horse over and seeing what you can see. And I think as horse vets we're actually quite lucky because horse owners are already very good at that because you all look at your horses and take notice of them anyway. So observe, um, basically what's your horse doing? Is it dull? Is it depressed? Is it standing on three legs? Is it sweated up? Is it pouring, stretching, rolling? Has it got a head tilt? Has it got a weepy eye, a cloudy eye, a swelling somewhere? Is it bleeding somewhere? Has it got nasal discharge? And if it has, is that from one nostril or both nostrils? And is it clear or is it blood or is it mucus? Has it got discharge from its mouth? There's so much information that you can gain just from looking. And the next thing is palpate and basically just, especially really from a vet's point of view, always have your hand on the horse. It gets them used to you. It stops them freaking out when you sort of dive in for their jugular or something to inject them. It's just always worthwhile. If there's a swelling on a shoulder or on, its, on the back end, you know, once you, if you've been over the whole horse, you'll feel that, that swollen, that warm area. Whereas if you're, you know, just having a quick look over, no, can't really see anything that, that major, then you might miss something, which actually, you know, we could do more about and we could make them more comfortable with. So it's always worth remembering, observe, palpate. We take the respiration rate first. The easiest place to watch it from is actually the point that you, that you can't see on flash dance at the moment, which is sort of her belly. And I always tend to watch the, the curve of the underside of her belly, just on one side. Um, and you're looking, obviously, once you can, um, can see inspiration, expiration for a continuous amount of time, obviously only count one, otherwise you'll get double the rate. Um, it's easier if you can get somebody else to do the counting for you so that you don't, uh, don't end up trying to count two things at the same time. But just watch wherever you've, you've sort of picked where you can see the breathing and watch that for 30 seconds and then double it and that will give you your respiratory rate per minute and that's, that's what we work in is minutes. Um, and obviously once you're paying attention to that you can see, you'll be able to see if they've got a heave line that they get with um, COPD, you'd be able to see if breathing's laboured, you'd be able to hear if breathing was too noisy. The pulse rate, you don't need a stethoscope for. You can take it from the facial artery which goes across the bottom of the mandible. So if you follow the mandible down, and I'm touching the bone here, run your finger down, you find that you get to something which is running across and your finger sort of pings across it. And that is the vein and artery going across there. It wobbles around an awful lot. So once you've sort of pinged your finger across it, what you need to do is try and stabilise it in between a couple of fingers and then put another finger on the pulse and then just wait and make sure you've got it. And then again, count for 30 seconds and then double it. Basically, the longer you time it for, the more accurate your rate is going to be at the end. Whereas if you just count for 10 seconds, it's going to be less accurate. Um, I actually, although this is the documented place to take the pulse from, I actually find it quite easier to take it from the transverse facial artery which runs across here. So if you find the, the bone around the eye socket, this is the zygomatic arch which goes up from it and there's a sort of indent underneath that arch and in there, there is the transverse facial artery and that forms a pulse that's really easy to feel and it's almost the same as taking your own pulse in your wrist like that. 
So, yeah, it's underneath here, about, and you follow it down, and you feel a sort of a line, and it's that line. The digital pulse, which you can take down at the fetlock. The neurovascular bundle come in, comes down the leg, and that's basically got the artery, vein, and the, and the nerve running in it. And if I pull my hand, my thumb back, along the side of the fetlock region, all of a sudden, when I get to near the back, I get a ping as my finger pings over that bundle. And it's the same on the inside as the outside because there's a bundle running down both, both sides. Once your finger's pinged past there, go back onto the thing it pinged over, and that is the bundle. So basically, once you've found it, you just need to move your fingers around on it until you can feel a pulse. And on flash dance at the moment, it's very easy to feel the pulse on the inside and not so easy on the outside. And it is, it's really common, especially when the horse is normal, to not be able to find that very easily. But if there's a hoof abscess or laminitis or something like that, that pulse is really, really strong. We describe it as a bounding pulse. And um, it's, it's not any faster or any slower than the, than the normal pulse, which is from the heart rate but it's just stronger and that tells you that there's some kind of inflammation going on in there in that foot. The next thing to look at would be the mucous membranes. So you just pull the top lip up and the bottom lip down and you're looking first and foremost, you'll feel the, feel the membranes and see if they're moist, nice and moist and slippery or if they're dry. If they're dry and quite tacky, it can mean that the horse is dehydrated and you can check that again by doing the skin tent on their neck. And if that, if when you pinch the skin, if it's if the tent, if it stays tented up, that's another indication that they might be a little bit dehydrated. As far as the colour of the membranes go, there's loads of normal variation, but they should be a normal, nice salmon pink. The times to worry are if they're yellow, which can mean um, liver disease. If they're very, very pale, especially if that's associated with, with bleeding, a lot of blood loss. Um, if they're brick red, that tends to mean that there's, there's um, a degree of bacteria or toxin in the blood and that they're in quite a bad state by the time they're brick red. Um, or if they're blue, which can mean that their respiratory system is failing and they're not getting enough oxygen into their tissues. And then for the temperature, I normally always hold the tail myself because I think it gives you information about whether the horse is about to move or not and also whether the horse is going to put up with what you're trying to do or not because if they don't like it they just really clamp their tail down and so you can hardly get the thermometer anywhere near. But, um, so hold the tail yourself, stand to the side especially when you're actually first inserting the thermometer but once the thermometer is in um, don't just leave it sort of sticking into space in there. You could be measuring the temperature of the air in there that's probably going to come out into your face in a minute. Um, or you could be taking the temperature of a ball of poo. So what you need to do once the thermometer's in is, is tilt, tilt it up or down or to one side or the other. And what actually happens then is it touches the rectal mucosal wall. So you are then getting a more true temperature rather than it sort of floating about in space in the middle. If your horse had colic, which I hope they don't ever, but if it did and we were on our way to you and you could call us with that information, if we knew that we were going to a horse with a heart rate of 60 and mucous membranes that were red, we'd know that that was an emergency and we had to get there fast. Whereas if the heart rate's 30 and the, um, the membranes are normal and moist and fine, then we, it wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't hit the accelerator quite so hard at that point. Mm -hmm.